Here we are, Barangaroo. My name's Jonathan Cartledge, Chief Executive at Consult Australia. Fantastic to be here. What better backdrop for today's conversations? A little bit wet, but nice to be nice to be inside and nice to be right here for these the traditional lands of the Gadigal people. I pay my respects to custodians of those lands, past and present, and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us here today. For the Gadigal, this was a place of recreation, canoeing, swimming, gathering food, and also on the foreshores, a place of congregation, which is what we're doing here today. And here at Barangaroo, named for the leading Camaragal woman, her legacy is powerful today, I would argue, as it was 230 years ago as a leader of the Eora Nation. And she was a leader, Barangaroo. She refused European clothes. She was one of few with a pierced septum and in visiting the colony would paint herself in white chalk to celebrate her spirituality and culture. Her character and her story is instructive. She was observed to be of persuasive and determined character. She broke her husband Ben Long's Spear, his fishing spear, when he met with the governor at Sydney Cove. She wasn't, she wasn't happy about that. <laughs> when a convict was flogged, it was Barangaroo that threatened the executioner with a flogging of his own. But she did die after childbirth in 1791. Her ashes were spread in Governor Phillips Gardens, now at Circular Quay. So as we meet here today, breaking barriers and building inclusion, let's take some inspiration from her leadership, from Barangaroo's leadership some 230 years ago now today. But there's no doubt as we look across this room and probably as you had conversations over a drink uh, and over a bite to eat, that firms in our industry and in industries generally are facing increased regulation and scrutiny. Whether it's industrial relations, professional standards, whether it's sustainability, information security, and as we gather here today and talk about diversity and inclusion, pay equity, the pay gap, these pressures and regulatory interventions are multifaceted and they're increasing for business. And expanding across an environment for firms where we now see businesses spanning five generations from boomers right down to Z. And it's the Z that are looking for businesses to take a stand more and more on critical social issues. In 23, Edelman, the trust barometer, reported that, quote, this is a classic business, remains the only institution seen as both ethical and competent. CEOs are expected to publicly take a stand on the treatment of employees, climate change, discrimination, the wealth gap, and immigration. No pressure. <laughs> Significant burdens. <coughs> but also opportunities. And today, this is about capturing the opportunity in this leadership forum with a focus on that latter issue. Taking the time today and taking the time out of your schedules to prioritise action, to take that regulation that is shaping your organisations when we talk about preventing and responding to workplace misconduct, talking about that not just as a business imperative, but increasingly as a human rights issue. In businesses in Australia, two in five women report having experienced sexual harassment at work. Younger employees, LGBT, racial minorities, even more vulnerable. Less than one in five victims fearing recrimination or assume nothing will be done report. And despite new legislation placing a positive duty as it came into effect in December last year, we are seeing new and more insidious avenues to harass. In a study released just last week, one in seven adults reported using tech to sexually harass a colleague. Nearly half of all perpetrators work in male-dominated workplaces, and the cost to business and the economy is estimated at close to $3 billion annually in Australia, with employers bearing about 70% of that cost in lost productivity, staff turnover, and managers' time. But it's the cost to personal lives, it's the cost to confidence and self-esteem, loss of job satisfaction and those safety concerns that endure. And misconduct that goes unaddressed by businesses can lead to far more sinister outcomes as we've seen. It was only two weeks ago that cities and towns across Australia came together in the rallies and the marches against gendered violence. Protesting the continuation of a state that's seen 29 women die at the hand, hands of gendered violence this year in New South Wales Police 
called last year to more than 500 domestic violence incidents every day. Of course, in the words of a former PM, not all acts of disrespect lead to violence against women, but every act of violence is underpinned by disrespect. Today is part of our Breaking Barriers and Building Inclusion program, supported by the New South Wales Government Women in Construction Initiative. And through this program, we've been able to develop new tools and resources to support businesses in navigating this environment, to support leaders to understand how they can gain the benefits of inclusion for their business, meet their regulatory obligations and deliver better outcomes for their teams and the community. This forum today is part of that program, but we are diving deeper into these issues with a one-day executive workshop, also complimentary and for a limited time only, uh, <laughs> but register for that one and have a chat to Linda at the end of the day uh, to, to register for that. We know that businesses of all sides need support to tackle these issues, and that's what has historically underpinned Consult Australia's Champions of Change program. Great to have David here as part of that program today and call out also to James Phyllis from SMEC as chair of the Champions, Consult Australia Champions of Change. And all of that has helped inform the design of this program and the workshop. We all have a role to play in creating a safe, respectful and inclusive culture in our workplaces, creating an environment where women and men have equal opportunity to reach their full professional potential. So today, what does that mean for your business? And that's why we've assembled an incredible panel here today to talk to those issues. And it's my great pleasure to introduce that panel and our facilitator today first up, and I'll introduce you and you can take a seat. Uh, Colleen McKinnon is the founder of Inclusivity Quotient, specialising in authentically engaging men in co-creating safe, respectful and high-performing workplaces, and our lead and advisor for the Consult Australia Champions of Change, established in 2015. Colleen, join me up here. Joining Colleen. With more than 20 years' experience in the construction sector, Alison Mirams has de delivered a legacy of change for all workers. In 2017, after successfully operating in executive roles at Brookfield Multiplex and Lendlease, Alison was founding CEO, taking Roberts Co. to 280 staff with a $1.5 billion pipeline in the first five years. More recently, it's an enviable mix of golf and family, Alison. So we're really grateful to have her joining us here with her insights here today. Alison, join us on stage and we'll give our panel a round of applause as they come up. <laughs> David Raftery, a member of the Consult Australia Champions of Change and Country Director and Business Area Director Resilience with Arcadis, an environmental engineer with over 25 years of experience, a passionate uh, leader in establishing inclusive and diverse work communities and embedding cultural knowledge aligned with business practice. Thanks, David, for joining us. Paul, Paul Collings, consultant, facilitator and coach, working with a range of, of clients across culture, senior team effectiveness and leadership development. A former associate principal with McKinsey, Paul was part of a team that developed and delivered the firm's pioneering approach to creating high performance cultures. Thank you, Paul. And finally, rounding out our incredible panel, Faye Calderone, brings over 20 years of experience helping leaders ensure legal compliance and foster safe, healthy, respectful and inclusive workplaces that enable people to thrive. Faye is Chair of the Diversity, Inclusion and Wellbeing Council at Hall and Wilcox Lawyers, boasting over a thousand partners across Australia where she is partner in employment and workplace relations. An incredible panel, <laughs> which I have the great pleasure of joining you to listen to, so I'm really looking forward to that. Over to you, Colleen. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Pleasure to be here. Um, I also want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present and my sincere hope that we find a path to truth, treaty, and reconciliation. I also want to acknowledge that the topic we're discussing today can be quite confronting. Um, all forms of behavioral misconduct, whether that be sexual harassment, bullying, or discrimination, can have a devastating effect on mental health and well-being. So I do invite, if anyone feels uncomfortable, needs to leave, please feel free to do so. And um, furthermore, if you feel you need to contact um, professional support after that, I, I, please, I encourage you to do so. Okay, um, before we launch into the new regulations, uh, let's take a step back. 
We know that a diverse workplace, one that reflects our community, our clients, and our, co and our um, customers, is the right thing to do. But it's often referred to as the bright thing to do. Better financial performance, better innovation, better employee engagement and attraction, and better marketplace reputation. So how does this show up or play out in the workforce? And I want to start with you, Alison. In your 30-year career, and she did start when she was about two years old, <laughs> in the construction industry, what have you witnessed or experienced as benefits to greater diversity and inclusion? And what, in your view, is really critical to creating an inclusive workplace? Thank you. Uh, and it's great to see so many people here today. Um, when I started in construction, it's, I think it's just important to reflect on what construction looked like. Um, there was porn in the toolboxes. There was porn on the lunchroom walls. Um, there were no toilets. The first project I was on, I didn't have a toilet on site. Uh, and I think what's worse is I didn't realise that was wrong till about five years ago or ten years ago when I thought, you know, I really should have had a toilet. I, I had to leave site and walk down the road to a commercial office. To help. So have we come a long way? Yes, we have. We have a long way to go. Um, a couple of the benefits, having a more diverse workforce, we think with our whole brain. Um, when I was in one of the construction companies, they said, we're going to um, introduce long longs, long sleeves, long pants. And I said, who's it for? And they said, everyone. And I was wearing a dress that day. And I said, but if we have a safety incident and I'm the GM, I can't go to site. And they said, yep. I said, well, you don't have to get changed. Why do I? And if your clients are female, are you going to say to her, she's in a skirt, you can't turn up? Now, it wasn't done under any malice. They didn't mean anything by it, but they didn't think about it. And when I raised it, they were like, yep, good point. And, and the policy did not go through as long longs. You could have skirts, um, you could have, you know, three-quarter length arms, that sort of thing. If we are designing places for society, you can't have one group designing because they don't understand everything. I never understood what, into, what went into a breastfeeding room until I had a child and I had to use one. Um, so it's important if you're designing a prayer room, uh, I don't understand what goes into a prayer room, it's not my culture. So you need everyone to be designing and, and we need our teams to look like society. Um, what we have found, having more women on site, having a more diverse workforce, we see much more compassion on site. Uh, I did a mental health podcast this morning with America and I said on that podcast that I have had a guy come to me and say I'm an alcoholic, another one come to me and say I've got a gambling addiction and another one came to me and said um, my wife's depressed, my wife thinks I'm depressed and she's left me. I wasn't their line manager but they all came to me and I think it's important that, um, that people feel safe, who they can talk to, that they've got someone in the organisation that they can go to and they can talk to and that's all, not always another guy. The construction industry is 98% male on site. It's got that egotistical, it's got um, a very aggressive culture on site. So we're trying to change that. Um, and it's important, this is not a feminist topic. What, what I see is we need to change the industry for men and women will benefit because it's a bloody tough industry on men. You know, it's not a women's issue, it's a people issue. So... When we built inclusive workplaces, the first thing I'm going to say is we need toilets. Uh, we need toilets for women, we need toilets for men, we need toilets for however you show up to work that you're comfortable to go there. We need PPE that fits women. Uh, I can, when I was at Lendlease, if I wore my orange PPE, I went to a site with yellow PPE and I stood out. If I wore my yellow, they had orange on. When we started Roberts, I said it's all orange because I don't want to stand out when I go to site. Um, so we need PPE that fits, that women feel comfortable. We stand out enough, we don't need to, you know, I don't need to wear a PPE that comes down to my knees and I look like I'm in a dress because I've got an extra, extra large on. Um, we need no sexually explicit graffiti. We need zero tolerance to bad behaviour. When we wrote our, um, our policies at Roberts when we started, I got the guys in the room and they were guys and I said, okay... When, when Daniel at the function gropes another girl's boobs, what are you going to do? And I named Daniel and Daniel was in the room and they said, no, sackable offence. I said, okay. When Tom says, um, she's just a scrag, they were like, mm, okay, maybe that's a notice. They wrote the policy that I wanted but I named people in the room because 
when you get to a policy and someone says, oh, yeah, but Colleen's a really good person and she's doing a great job and we can't afford to lose her, it's a very hard conversation. So when we wrote the policy, it was named and it was senior people. Um, and when I know that it succeeded was when the team started to call out the bad behaviour and say, no, that person's got to go. Um, we need uh, an openness to listen and adjust. You won't always get it right, but you need to listen and you need to be willing to adjust so that people feel included. When you bring women into your teams, when I first started, I brought women onto site, I put one on each site because I thought, this is great, I'll have one on every site, but I isolated them. That was a disaster, totally wrong thing to do. You've got to put them together, you've got to give them the support network for them to survive and thrive together. So don't put them one out, give them the network they need. Um, it needs to be driven and it needs to be measured and it is a constant. Everything you do, um, you need to measure it monthly. When you do pay rises, you need to make sure that you look at it and say, have I got, um, have I got women in the same proportion as men? Have I got women in the proportion that they represent the company? Uh, when you are doing sponsorships, make sure that you've got women as much as you've got men when you're doing mentoring. When you've got a function, make sure that at Lend-Lease it was 32% female. If you cut it down the middle, every function, 32% of the attendees had to be women. That was driven by the CEO. And it needs to be driven by the CEO as core business. This is not an HR initiative. This is not something off to the side. This is not a nice to have. This makes you more money. This makes good business sense, but it's also morally the right thing to do. So it needs to be driven by the CEO and it is forever. It is not, I'll do it for the next six months. This is forever. So that's a very long answer. <laughs> it's a very complete answer. I hope you've got um, devices because if there's a lot of really good stuff in there. Thanks very much, Alice. And David, I'd like to turn to you. What do you see as the benefits of a more diverse workforce, work diverse teams, and what does it take to create that? Uh, firstly, um, thank you for making me go after Alison. That's <laughs> awesome. Um, I didn't do a podcast in North America this morning. I just about got dressed <laughs> and managed to get to the airport. Uh, and even that was a logistical nightmare. So uh, if I could just take us back a step, I wanted to acknowledge two things in Jonathan in your opening comments. The first was the integrity of your acknowledgement to country. It's brilliant when you travel around the country to get a little bit of history to expand your acknowledgement of country so it isn't a rote repetition. It should never be rote. The second thing is, I I'm struggling, to be quite honest with you, to process the statistics that you read out. And I'm struggling for Alison to say the policy was there should be no pornographic material on the walls. Like, just think about the absurdity. It's almost laughable if it wouldn't be offensive if I started laughing here. Like, it's difficult to process the statistics. It's, it's hard to contain the emotional response about the situation that we find ourselves in. And I'm acutely aware that I've fallen off the privilege tree and I've hidden every branch on the way down. Every single branch on the way down. So I don't mean to sit here and say I'm the victim as the white middle-aged cisgendered male. I'm not. But it's difficult to just consider those statistics for a second. They are overwhelming. They really are overwhelming. Two weekends ago, I went with my two of my daughters to Melbourne to the march, 15 or 16,000 people. I regularly put my foot on it with my daughters. And I was trying to be the empathetic dad and be aware. And we walked down and we got to Fed Square. It was, a, it was very emotional. It was really, it was very emotional. And my mum made me watch a lot of Lassie movies as I was growing up. So I can cry <laughs> in a heartbeat on the television and I think I'm showing my age there. But I was struggling to contain my emotion. We got to Fed Square. And I read out the names of the 29 women that lost their lives. I said to my 19-year-old eldest daughter, I said, this is, this is terrible. And she said, yep. And she said, I said to her, this is anxiety generating, isn't it? And she said, absolutely it is. And she said, I kind of said something silly like, I, I know how you feel. And she looked at me dead-eyed, looked at me dead-eyed and said, you don't know how I feel. I thought, I don't. I don't know how I feel. I'm not going to answer the question. I apologize. But... <laughs> I read an article, and you know, we're, we're, a lot of people are data in the room here, engineers and scientists. There was an article on the ABC that said there's a, a million people have expressed fear about using public transport late at night. So you know what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks? There'll be workshops about design, amending the design of public, um, um, public uh, transport stations. There won't be a discussion about changing the behaviours. 
we should change the design of the station. Hold on, like, <laughs> there's a lot, a lot wrong. Right, I've got that off my chest, I apologize. <laughs> let's, let's kind of go back to the question. The benefits, I wrote an answer out and then I changed the answer as I was trying to get from the airport uh, into the city. Um, if you think about inclusion and diversity, uh, in my time in a previous employer, they had a brilliant tagline, which was bring your whole self to work. So that's allowing yourself to be, um, to, to not hide any part of you in a psychosocially safe work environment. So I want that, absolutely. But I want to bring their best selves to work. So if you think about an environment that's first of all inclusive, because it has to be underpinned by inclusivity, because if you go for the targets and it's not inclusive, you're setting us back even more. So there's a sense of inclusivity and there's a sense of empathy and caring and all of those really important things because people are looking for employers that are values-based and then we have diversity. Maybe the person in a minority group can go into work that morning with a high sense of energy and they can, they can really demonstrate their awesomeness and maybe somebody might say to them, hey, you're bringing great energy to work today, you're going to do great stuff. Now think of the flip side of that for a second, right? They don't feel psychosocially safe. We know that anxiety and fear are two things that will rob you of your energy. And again, I don't mean to be disingenuous as the white male, but we know that those two emotional responses will drain you of energy. You're going in with lower energy. One thing might happen to you when you commute to work. We talked a little bit about the, com the compounding effect of small things happening. One thing happens on the way to work. More energy gone. So the energy bank account is getting close now, right? Then you go into the work environment and you talk about those things that shouldn't be there and you encounter those. You are really close to negative energy. You're not gonna get the best out of that person. Not even close, not even close. So we're gonna talk about, in the next couple of months, compliance with legislation. We're gonna talk about compliance with legislation. And if you just think about that for a second and you go, um, how was your day at work? Yeah, it was good. It was pretty good, yeah. Anything happen? Well, nobody did anything illegal to me today. <laughs> if you repeat that to your nearest and dearest at the end of the day, they're going to say, you are in the wrong workforce. <laughs> so it can't be about compliance. I think it needs to be about the high performance. We're all involved in business. We're all wanting good outcomes for our people and good financial outcomes and all of those great things that underpins consultancy. But for me, it's about the business performance allowing everybody to be brilliant. If we are still talking about a business case for why we should be doing this, if you're considering that here, you're, you're at the wrong meeting. Like there's 40 years of data. You may as well be saying the earth is flat or climate change isn't real. Maybe some of you think it isn't real in the room. There's 40 years of data about the benefits. We've got to move on from that. I don't think I answered the question at all, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought it was a great answer. Um, I will add to it. Uh, we've got a mix of firms in the room, so we've got small, medium, and large. For the small and mid-sized firms, I can't stress enough how much open source material there is on the internet. So, for example, if you had to build a business case for diversity and inclusion, even though there's 40 years of data, you might not have that on one page. But there's, if you get 600 million hits, you say, write me a business case. Now you've got ChatGPT. You can say, write me a business case. <laughs> but there, there's that. If you want something on, um, you can go to Fay right away. If you want something on, how do I? We meet our regulations around positive duty. Um, I need to know how to sponsor women because women are less likely to be sponsored than men. Not for any, you know, reasons, uh, malevolent reasons, but more because we are attracted to those who look like us, who sound like us, who come from similar backgrounds. How do I sponsor women? Write me a sponsorship case. So there is a lot available out there to get started. Colleen, th you very subtly brought me back to the question. One more quick thing. There's a lot of big consultancy representatives here. Hello to everybody and welcome. If you're from a smaller business, maybe you don't have a HR team. And if you're in a position of leadership, you are going to be the constant voice around inclusion and diversity. And people can quickly disengage from you delivering the message Find your ally. Find the only heretic in the village in your business and try to generate some curiosity in them and let them support you in the message as well. So then it's kind of multi-pronged because if you are a single HR manager in a business or you're a CEO or, or a leader, 
um, people will very quickly go, oh, well, it's their job to talk about inclusion and diversity. Find a person who's a bit of a naysayer or maybe not a believer, generate some curiosity. If they can support you in the message, literally the effectiveness is orders of magnitude higher. Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, Faye, we've talked about some of the benefits of creating a safe, respectful, inclusive culture, but there are still significant barriers. One of the most commonly cited by women is a bit of a blokey or a boys club culture, largely because it's still a male-dominated industry. This new legislation aims to curb this uh, behavior by placing the onus on employers to prevent sexual harassment, bullying, and discrimination. So can you give us a really high-level overview of the new positive duty legislation? Absolutely. And I'll answer your question after I make my sideline comments because that's <laughs> what we do on this panel. Um, just to echo the sentiment, I, I, ha I have to say, Jonathan, that was probably one of the best introductions I've heard, both in terms of the welcome to country, but also um, segue into everything I'm about to speak about. Because, you know, we talk about the law, but before we talk about the law, I always like to talk about, you know, the benefits as, w as we have today, but also, you know, why are we here? Why did the law come about? And w what is it that's so fundamentally wrong um, that, you know, we're constantly talking about... Um, you know, recommendations and making, uh, you know, why we need uh, respect at work laws to be introduced and why we need a positive duty. And I think there was a lot of, um, there, was a, there was an expectation, I suppose, or, or a, a misrepresentation for a while that we've come a long way and that we don't need these things anymore because there are bathrooms on, um, you know, on site where, where you know, both genders and, and um, can use and that there are, uh, you know, we don't have pornography or, you know, pictures of naked women on our walls anymore and therefore, you know, we've come a long way. Um, but when you really do dig into the data, it's very clear that, um, you know, s sexual harassment, um, sex-based harassment victimisation and um, conduct that is hostile on the grounds of sex, which is what the positive duty tries to, is addressing, is very much still prevalent in Australian workplaces. Um, and it is, it is something that for many years, I've been practising for 25 years, the onus was on complainants or on employees or victim survivors as we call them, to, um, to address. So if something had occurred in the workplace, then that person had to um, make a complaint, assuming there was something that was a, uh, there was a complaint resolution procedure in the workplace. And it wasn't off, like, that wasn't always the case, but, you know, more recently there is a policy and there is a complaint mechanism. They would then, you know, make that complaint and um, sometimes it would be addressed, sometimes they would be quietly exited um, and they would have to um, trot on off to the Australian Human Rights Commission to make an application um, about, you know, what they'd experienced in the workplace. Months later, there might have been a conciliation and eventually um, if they were... Um, robust enough and um, had deep pockets and tenacity um, would take the matter to the Federal Circuit Court or to the Federal Court where they would commence proceedings against their, you know, by this stage often previous employer um, while they're also trying to either look for new work and um, or, or in new work um, in the public domain that they fund to eventually get to the end of it, there is a point to this, to eventually get to the end of it and then if they've been in employment and they haven't been broken, so to speak, and unemployed and, you know, sort of seeking um, serious psychological interventions for post-traumatic stress syndrome, for example, um, there would be very little economic loss that they have suffered. And general damages um, at the top end... Um, you know, a, a decade ago, were increased to $100,000 in one of our precedent cases on the basis that, you know, the 20, that less than $20,000 that had been awarded at first instance by the trial judge um, was not consistent with community standards. Um, and therefore, you know, this $100,000 sort of rough, you know, sort of test in the air was, was the general damages component. So basically, if people bounced back with rigour, um, there was very little incentive to take a matter all the way to the federal court, and it's also a cost jurisdiction. 
That is why we now have a positive duty. That is why it is the cornerstone of the legislation. Um, and that is why the onus is very squarely on leaders in, per, uh, uh, in organisations across Australia to now take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate not only sexual harassment, but sex-based harassment, which is not sexual in nature, um, and uh, conduct that is hostile on the grounds of sex, as well as discrimination and victimisation from our workplaces. That is a provision that the Australian Human Rights Commission can come in and undertake inquiries in relation to now. Um, it, is a, it is something that um, enforceable undertakings can be um, required or compliance notices can be issued and you can either enter into an enforceable undertaking or there could be um, enforcement action in the federal court for, for the purpose of those notices. On top of that, you also have a duty in the Fair Work Act now to eliminate um, sexual harassment and applications can be made for orders to stop sexual harass harassment in the um, Fair Work Commission. Um, and then finally, the safety regulators are very much focused on psychosocial hazards, which um, of, of which sexual harassment and a lot of the conduct issues that we're discussing are very squarely psychosocial hazards in the workplace, which manifest both in... Um, in psychological but also physical consequences if you have, you know, a continuous, um, to, to your point, the continuous uh, exposure to these hazards. Um, so finally, I will say that um, uh, you've almost, if I would have, I would have said that you uh, read my book and stole my words earlier, but it's not published yet. Um, but the framework is safe. Um, and the reason it is exactly the point that we start with baseline compliance is the S in, in safe. We align with purpose and values. We flourish with flexibility and we exit jerks um, because that's what good <laughs> leadership is about. Um, sorry to be such a long, uh, long-winded answer, but um, I think that sets the framework from a legal point of view. It's a large topic, and you were very succinct, I would say. Uh, thanks, Faye. Paul, turning to you, we've done a fair amount of work over the years, uh, mainly with senior corporate men, on the barriers and enablers to workplace inclusion, and I think it's probably fair to say that one of the uh, most challenging, or the one of the issues that um, particularly men find most challenging is this issue around workplace misconduct, sexual harassment. Um, indeed, it probably makes some men a little bit uncomfortable. Um, it can be quite confronting. To the point that we're wis witnessing some pushback, actually, men concerned they can't get ahead given the focus on affirmative action to level the playing field for women or that they have to really watch what they're doing at the workplace now. So how do we authentically engage versus alienate the men in the room, particularly given the critical role they play in creating inclusive workplaces and high-performing workplaces, to your point, David? Yeah, thanks, Colleen, and hi, everyone. Um, I think the first thing to do is to acknowledge that this is actually a really difficult thing to do because what we're talking about is asking human beings, like all of us, to challenge, well, first investigate, challenge our beliefs, potentially change behaviours that have been habitual and have been going on for decades. If it was easy to do that, you know, I think we'd be living in a much better world today. So I will come to what I think helps and enables us to do this, but let's first of all, just to be clear, talk about what does not work. As Colleen mentioned, uh, we've been working together, doing engaging men workshops and, and uh, programs to create more inclusive cultures in organisations, largely working in male-dominated industries. And what we've found is that in places where there's been a top-down mandated approach that has not been, where there hasn't been context provided, then inevitably we see a lot of backlash. 
we see a lot of men complaining about reverse discrimination, complaining about the women who got promoted ahead of them, etc. So we know that doesn't work. Um, and it's pretty clear, and just put yourself in the shoes of some of these men that we're talking about. The other thing that doesn't work is when we take a judgmental approach and we make them wrong or bad. You know, as soon as we do that, regardless of what the topic is, people put up defensive barriers and actually tend to argue themselves further and further into the corner they're, they're coming from. So they're the things that, that don't work. I think the first thing is that if we want to engage with men around this issue, um, we have to do it from a place of non-judgment. We have to do it from a place uh, where we are encouraging a sense of curiosity. That, that's, that's critical. I think you know, any approach that comes from the other place is doomed to fail. Um, I think the second thing, and again, this is based on the experience we've had, is that it's important that men actually understand the bigger context. And here I'm talking about both the historical context and also just the current context of what's going on and the impact of that. Um, I mentioned the historical context because if I think about my own journey on this, uh, so my wife is an educator, author on the area of uh, women's spirituality and empowerment. And about 20 years ago, she wrote an essay and she called it Herstory as opposed to History. And in it, she documented over the thousands of years the way that the patriarchal culture had been established and the impact that it had on women. And I remember she gave it first draft for me to read and I remember reading through it and I just had this really quite profound moment of holy shit yeah this is what we're dealing with um, one of our friends and colleague David Laser uh, wrote a book published a couple of years ago called Women, Men and the Whole Damn Thing he also did a fantastic job of documenting that history and if you're interested I'd really recommend that book to you um, so it's really helpful for men to get that context and then also we share with them what's going on now in terms of the biases that are built into all the processes that we have, the barriers that women are confronting um, and really address things like, you know, the sort of the easy pushback to some of these targets and affirmative action things to say, well, we just want to hire and promote people based on merit. Well, yeah, that's, that's a fair place to start but let's look at the reality that usually sitting behind all of the processes that end up with this so-called merit-based decision into all those processes is usually built all kinds of bias whether it's selection panels you know the way we're recruiting all, all of those sort of things um, so it's really helpful for men first of all to get their heads around what's actually going on also really helpful for them to hear from their female colleagues we do this Confidentially, Colleen does a focus group with the women, asks them about their experience of working there. Usually after we've gone through the barriers and the biases, we get lots of men saying, oh yes, yes, it's terrible, it's like that out here, but it's not like that here. And we say, hang on a minute, Let's show, let us show you what your women colleagues are saying. And again, it's a, it's a moment of uh, kind of dawning. Oh shit, it's happening here. It's happening with men around this room. So I think that context is really important. Um, and then I think the third thing that's really helpful is for men to have an opportunity to reflect on where do our beliefs around gender roles, where do they come from? What were the influences that shaped our way of thinking, our way of seeing the world growing up? So thinking about well, what were my parents like? What were the roles in our family like? Uh, um, what happened at school? You know, if we all think back to our school days, I grew up in the country in Western Australia, hyper-masculinized society um, where being anything other than a really tough footballer was going to get you teased and, and ostracized. And um, we talk about religion. Uh, you know, for many people, it's not so much an issue, but for many people, it really is an issue. And that's been baked into religion in terms of the text, the way things are done. My father was a Church of England minister and um, growing up I never saw a woman at the front of a church. Um, and just thinking about media, advertising, films, all of that, it's built in, it's 
You know, it's like, you would have all heard the metaphor, it's like the fish in water who doesn't know what water is. We're, we're in a, inside a culture that we just don't see. So one of the things that's really helpful is to help people to sort of stand back and, and see these things and to see where they come from for the men. In doing that, it starts to open up the possibility that men can bring what's kind of invisible to them, their beliefs, make them visible. And, and as we start to see these, we get more choice of, well, is that, do I really hold that belief anymore? Because inside, I think everyone, is a fundamental value of fairness. And I think when men can see, this is not fair, this is just not fair, then it starts to open the possibility that, that we can make progress. Um, the, the third thing, and it's been mentioned a couple of times here, is... Uh, the benefits to men of creating more inclusive, more equitable cultures and workplaces. Um, obviously from a mental health point of view, uh, recent man box study that some of you might have seen um, concluded or was able to demonstrate that men who hold traditional values around gender roles are eight times more likely to have suicidal thoughts talking to James beforehand, he was saying in the construction industry that in the construction industry they're seven times more likely to have suicidal thoughts, so those numbers kind of line up. Um, and so there's a whole mental health piece around that, that there's a benefit for men here. And you know, chatting to lots of men over the years, um, most men, not all men, but most men actually really appreciate team, being in teams that are more diverse. Uh, so there's, there's real benefits to men. And the other big piece too, you know, um, uh, I think something like three quarters of the, su of the suicides in Australia are male. Something like two thirds of them are a result of financial stress. How is it that we've created a situation where men feel like if they're not winning financially that they're going to kill themselves? I mean, how, how, how did we get here? So. We need to shift this, and in shifting it, we create a better place, obviously for women, but, but also for men. And I think the final thing I'd say is, um, uh, let me say something stereotypical, and it's probably, I don't know how true it is, but you know, men like action. Men like to know, what can we do about this? Yeah, but, I mean, a lot of women do too, right? But, um, so I think the, the other thing is, is to help men see, well, what can they do about it? Because I think part of the, you know, Colin and I often talk about, well, why don't men get more engaged in this whole thing? And I think a, whole, a lot of the time is men don't know what to do. Even the men who are well-meaning can see what's going on. So talking about practical actions like uh, overcoming the bystander effect and calling out bad behaviours in meetings, like sponsoring women, like uh, in a meeting um, making sure that you're hearing from the women and not just from the men. Just kind of basic behaviours like that. And I think when men get an idea, okay, there's something we can do here. And what we found, which is really encouraging, last thing I'll say is that, um, you know, I often, as I do a lot of work in uh, culture and leadership in organisations, and I often think about culture as being the rules of belonging around here. You know, what does it take to belong? And as humans, belonging is a fundamental need. We're hardwired to observe what does it take to belong around here. By working with the male leaders in an organisation and getting that shift and having these kind of conversations, you start to shift the rules of belonging. So that if in the past the rule of belonging was such that if a sexist comment was made, we all chuckle and look away, um, let's shift that. And all of a sudden we see that actually the majority of the men and the women, now the rules of belonging are starting to shift. You want to belong around here, you've got to call that behaviour out. So it can be done. I do believe that we need to be patient and... We also need to keep keep pushing. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> Alison. Yes, you can add. <laughs> Just to give you some hope that it's that it's not difficult. Um, one of the things we really pushed at Roberts was five days a week to get more women into the industry. We've got to change the working hours. Um, we do, whether we like it or not, biologically, we are designed to bring children into this world. And a lot of women leave the industry because they say, "I can't have a family and be a mum." and have a career. And I've seen many women leave the industry before they're pregnant, before they've got a partner, because they say, I can't do it, I'll get another career while I'm young. Um, so we made a really big push to change the industry to five days a week. 
And a lot of people say to me, what do the unions say about it? The unions are my biggest advocate because the unions could see it was better for men. It was benefiting their membership because dads were home, dads were seeing their kids, dads turned into ballet dads, they were taking their daughters to ballet. Um, and they started to see that, yes, I might have dropped some money because I'm not getting as much overtime, but my life is richer because I'm spending more time with my family. Kids stopped acting out at school because dad was home during the week. Um, it made an enormous difference to men and women benefit. So the union started to say this is amazing and they are now pushing it around the country. Um, they've taken it because they can see the benefit to their membership. Great. Thanks, Alison. David, did you want to add anything in terms of, you know, whether witnessing pushback and how you would address that? Um, yeah, a couple of things maybe. I, I think it's in the minority that you get the pushback, but by saying that, I'm not diminishing it. You know, when I was in the march in Melbourne, it was like not all men, but, you know, not all men, but some men kind of thing. It, like, so by saying that it's in the minority, I'm not saying that it diminishes the impact I tend to not get involved in the argument because I think a lot of the time some of these individuals are seeking an argument to sort of um, almost validate their own echo chamber. And they're also recruiting, they tend to do it in an audience and they tend to say, oh, but what about, you know, it's no longer a level playing field. Well, it was never a level playing field. It stopped being a level playing field about five odd thousand years ago and I'm not from here originally and where I was born, we had a very rich, pagan culture where most of the deities were women, most of the warriors that were women. Um, when the smells and the bells and the hats arrived, things started to go a little awry for us. A really interesting historical context to consider that. Um, so I don't get a lot of direct backlash, but you and I have talked a little bit about the recruiting of the backlash and the kind of sh the shock and awe that sometimes teenage teenagers want to implement and, and teenage boys sometimes want to do a bit of shock and awe. And so now we have very prominent um, people, I I'm going to say like they're kind of masquerading as philosophers or thought leaders, and they're recruiting on the shock and awe. So there's this social media message that's kind of perpetuating the argument at work, and, and I struggle a bit, I struggle a bit sometimes to, to be reasonable and calm with the argument because it, well, it's not reasonable and I don't want to be calm when I face it, but I have to try to throttle back and listen, first of all, and maybe ask a couple of questions, all the while my anger and frustration is really boiling over at the back of this calm facade, and then maybe try to generate a bit of curiosity. But I think the level playing field, it's, it hasn't been a level playing field is the first thing. Um, it's getting a little leveler, but it's still fairly tilted towards men. We've only had like 5,000 years of a good run. And I think the other thing is the interrelationship between, I think, a pandemic of men's mental health and this issue. There is a, there is a little interrelationship there. And it is, this isn't a poor man um, answer that I'm giving. But there's some, there's some little interrelationship about the suicide rates. And Paul, as you say, how did we get to this point where there's pressure on the men to provide uh, the vast majority of men that I know and have worked with would really love to have taken long periods of time off work to stay at home, um, e either for kids or to do something outside of, of rearing kids in terms of volunteer work and things like that. Um, I, I'm uh, older than a lot of you in the audience, but I didn't have that opportunity. I got a day or two a week, which was fantastic, but I had to mount this huge argument about it. And yeah, pottered around with the three girls in the playgrounds, love and life, you know, doing the Play-Doh and the Fisher Price and all that. Brilliant. The, 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 the salary package went down, but the richness, mm -hmm. yeah, it went way up. So I think, I'll go back to the question, sorry. Um, I think that the generating a little bit of the curiosity, being calm in going up against the go, go woke, go broke brigade, being calm in that message and asking some questions is kind of important. You know what else is quite interesting is uh, if there's web content people in the audience, the next statement excludes you. But if you go back and have a read of what the information on your company website says about people and culture, the vast majority of the people who are questioning some of these initiatives are in direct non-compliance with the visions and values of the company as well. And kind of say, look, by the way, 
if you had a little read of the people and culture section on our website, you can see we've actually committed to a lot of these things as well. They tend to be recruiting a little bit noisy. They can run out of steam pretty quick, but it still has a very adverse impact, and I don't want to talk down the adverse impact. Thanks, David. I, I do um, agree that it's typically a small minority um, who are really quite vocal. Um, that said, as humans, we are a curious lot. And we don't like to be told what to do. We like to understand what we're being asked to do and why. And oftentimes we get called in because there's been no explanation as to why we've set this target of 30% women across the board. Um, and there's just this um, demand almost and uh, a lot of um, anxiety in, a, in an industry where there still are only 20%, um, just 20% of women graduating. So I think to add to that, the very first thing is, well, why do we want diversity in the first place, as you've all so well articulated? But secondly, why do we need these initiatives? And we need these initiatives because of all of the assumptions and the biases and the systemic barriers that still exist but when we understand the impact of those and the impact it has on our female colleagues or potential colleagues, then there's a much greater chance that people will enthusiastically, enthusiastically join as opposed to sort of, okay, fine. Yeah, so the education piece has to come before the target arrives. Yes. Um, because the target is another point of pressure to achieve. Yeah. Um, and it, it really can be inadvertently disengaging and almost recruit the negative. So the education mm -hmm. piece and the development of curiosity, that really does need to come before the target. I'm a massive fan of targets, but foster the conversation and generate the curiosity before or as the target lands. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's another flag on the hill for them to mm -hmm. wave and say, I'm not buying into this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a really important yeah. point. Yeah. We're gonna move to our last question because we wanna make sure there's time for questions from all of you. Well, maybe not all of you, but some of you. Um, and we're going to turn to another new piece of legislation, Faye, <laughs> and that is the um, gender pay gap public reporting. Um, so could you give us just sort of an overview of that, the new requirements, and for, for those of you who are either already reporting or who will be, um, it's for employers of 100 of or 100. more. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and because it is, uh, you've either reported, um, in which case you, you know you've been through the process, um, or when you will report, you'll you know, become familiar with the requirements online. I'm not going to go through a tick box um, here with you today. Um, but the fundamental premise of it is that accountability, uh, sorry, transparency builds accountability and that we will see um, you know, s some of the uh, gender pay gaps closing in um, the, the industries, particularly where, where they are the widest. But um, more broadly, there are six pillars that are focused on um, change that are part of the camp, uh, part of the communication and education campaign that the Workplace Gender Equality Agency has put out. Um, employers over 500, um, with over 500 employees, have an obligation to have policies around those pillars. Most of them um, we've spoken about today. Um, but if you're a smaller employer, um, it is in fact how you will close your gender pay gap regardless. I mean, that's um, the, f the very fact that you are publishing, uh, the, the data is now being published, that you are in an environment where your staff are able to talk to each other about their pay now because there is no pay secrecy under the Fair Work Act as well. So um, they can communicate with each other what their income is. They don't have any obligation to disclose it, of course, but, um, it, but they can't be disciplined for telling each other what their remuneration is and they can't be disciplined um, for disclosing who got a bonus or who didn't get a bonus. Um, so we've got the public report reporting of the, of the pay gap for most um, larger employers, and we say larger employers from 100 and up. Over um, 500, you've got the requirement to build the policy, to have the policies in place. Um, but the only way that you're really going to close that gap in an environment where you are being um, pressured to engage and retain staff 
is by um, addressing the issues. And so broadly, it is to do with the gender composition of the workforce, which is a harder challenge, obviously, in your industry. Um, but it does also look at the gender composition of your governing bodies, so your boards, your leadership, um, it, the remuneration as compared uh, between men and women. Um, in the construction industry, we know the median total remuneration gap is 31.8% and there's a midpoint gap of 25.8% depending on how the data is reported. Um, and then a lot of the things that we've spoken about today, um, so sexual harassment and conduct issues are now being reported to the Workplace Gender Equality um, Agency because you know, primarily we know that those environments are, uh, where, where the conduct is prevalent in those environments is going to be a disincentive to women staying in that environment but also pro um, also progressing into leadership roles which means there's again more likely to be a pay gap. So there is an intersectionality or an overlap between the issues and therefore we are reporting, while we're addressing the conduct issues in one hand, we're also reporting on whether or not we've got policies and procedures and whether or not we've got um, training programs. And then finally, um, the key pillar that we've, we've been talking about today, which is flexible work arrangements and the fact that they should be, um, well, flexible work arrangements and arrangements for people with carers' responsibilities and, and families and the fact that they need to be indiscriminately offered um, to everyone within the workplace because, you know, so long as they are being selectively offered to those that are entitled to them under the Fair Work Act um, and that need to meet certain criteria, those are the people that um, are going to be accommodated and therefore um, more likely to stick out and ultimately um, adversely affected if, if there is backlash or if there is, you know, decision making as a result of them taking flexible work arrangements. If everybody takes it indiscriminately, then of course there's less likely to be discrimination, more progression, smaller pay gap. That's a wrap, I think. <laughs> That's great, Faye. Um, Alison, you did a bit of an analysis on, analysis on the construction industry, gender pay gap. It's pretty depressing. Yeah. Um, the worst offender, I think, was at 52.5%. Uh, L.U. Simons in Melbourne, I will name them and shame them. Um, what was really interesting is the companies with the highest gender pay gaps were the ones that have been resisting the cultural change in industry. Now, um, they're the ones who are resisting five days a week. They're the ones who say that's the way we've always done it. When you look at L.U. Simon's website, and please go back and look at it, it is full of men on the website and it is full of... We have people with 20, 30, 40 year histories in our company you will never get a change in that organisation. You won't get fresh innovation in those companies. Women are looking at where do I work, uh, to your point earlier about websites. Uh, if your company website is all men, women will look at it and say, I don't belong there, I don't fit there. If you're a person of colour and you don't see that, you'll say, I don't belong there as well. So people are doing that filtering before they start. My concern with, with Gia's reporting and having been through the first round of it is you can doctor the system if you want to. So, and, and I wrote a piece in the AFR for them. I worry that companies will say, you know, if you've got a high gender pay gap, it's not saying that men and women are paid different. It's not saying you haven't got light for light pay. What it's saying is women are in a low level in the organisation vis-a-vis -vis men in the high positions. Um, and there are two numbers that they report. One is base salary and one is base with bonus. And they are very different numbers in the big companies because there's bigger bonuses. If you want to close your gender pay gap, you'll stop, you'll stop bringing in female cadets. You'll stop bringing in female grads and you'll put women higher in your organisation. That's a quick fix because you've then got no talent pipeline coming through. What is important when you're reporting is the story that goes behind it and the timeline you're putting behind it. Yes, right now we've got a 30% pay gap. But what we're doing to address that is in 12 months we'll look like this, in 24 months we'll look like this, in 36 months we'll look like this. It's not a quick fix. It's a very long fix and I think it's very important to say on like for like pay, at Roberts we did like for like pay analysis every single month because it is easy to get out of kilter when people change roles and get promoted. 
the other thing you need to do is in big organisations is line managers need to go and do the pay review, not HR. People change jobs all the time, job classifications, codes changes. If HR do it in the background, they just look at code for code and they say, yep, the codes are all right, but if the code is wrong to the person's position today, the salary will be wrong. So um, I had it done to me once where HR did it in the background. They said, it's all perfect. And I said, but it's not because that person doesn't do that role anymore. But HR can't know that. You need a line manager to check the codes, then run your pay gap. Um, but please take a long-term approach to it and please have a progress that you can tell your staff of what you're doing because don't stop bringing women in at the bottom to fix it. You can fix it very easily by getting one senior person at the top. It's not the right answer. And, and I, I worry that people go, I don't want to be named and shamed. I'll find a senior female. It's not the right answer. Yeah, thanks, Alison. And to that point about having managers look at this, as well as Faye's point about transparency, I'll share a story from a few years back. Paul and I were working in an organization I won't name because actually they're doing good work now. Um, uh, one of the leaders said, when I discovered there was a pay gap on my team, I went and I found that this woman was being drastically underpaid. I went to my boss and I showed him this and he goes, yeah, we get a much better deal on the women. <laughs> he said, that's not the right answer. Um, we're gonna turn to an audience Q&A. I wanna first thank, and everyone will remain here so that if you wanna direct a question to one of the panelists, but I do wanna thank Alison, Faye, Paul, and David for sharing your insights, um, your stories so honestly and candidly. Um, so, Jonathan, are you moderating the Q&A? I will, I'll moderate the Q&A. Who's the brave first person? And if you do have to leave right now, no one's gonna shame you. Nope, someone's just, oh, brave person in the... <laughs> Hi, um, I work for Carpentry Australia. We're a membership-based organisation of about 10,000 chippies across Australia. Um, and we're going through, I guess, a bit of a reshape and a reshift at the moment, in part led by myself for a lot of the issues we're talking about here today. And one of the things I think I would love to know is how can we, as an organisation, support a lot of these SMEs through these changes? Because there is a lot of talk at, I guess, uh, medium-sized business to higher businesses, particularly in construction and the way we tender and all those things. But how do we s support those you know, mum and dad businesses, the ones that have two, three, four employees, maybe they're taking on their first apprentice, how do we help them do better? It can be anyone. I think Alison is the obvious choice, but I would love everyone's input. Um, just looking for advice. Thank you. Um, what I would do is share what good looks like. Uh, so when we started Roberts, we wrote our contracts from scratch, our subcontract, and, and we did seven different forms depending on how big they were. I send them to people and I say, if you want to copy it, copy it. Copying is the highest form of flattery. So they don't have to go to a lawyer and rewrite it. So if someone has a really good policy, you can share it with them. You can tell them, um, you know, it would be very hard for them to keep up with legislation. Uh, you know, I subscribe to a lot of lawyers' websites, their websites are amazing and they send out practice notes all the time. So that's how I stay up to date with a lot of things just for myself. Um, so I think when we started Roberts, I took the approach that we will try and change the industry. It's not a competitive advantage. I'll get a competitive advantage because we're small and I'll move first. But I was far more interested in trying to change the industry than having a competitive advantage. So I think just sharing with them when something good is done, on a site or in a company, share it with your membership to say, hey, this is happening on this site, this is amazing, it's something you could consider. When you try and say to someone running a company, hey, you're running a company, but you have to do this and this and this, they don't have the time, they don't have the headspace. Give it to them on a platter is what I would say and, and share. 
it, it's a Herculean task that you have, but it's an amazing opportunity. And I think about my first job that I kind of fell into. It was a, a mum and dad business, Kevin and Anne. Um, and Anne was an accountant and she did the books and Kevin was a hydrogeologist and a brilliant guy. And, and from they just set the platform straight away. So I didn't know anything different. My first boss, Terry, was a woman. I've had several female bosses down through the years, which has been brilliant. Currently, I report into Heather in North America. Um, if you could highlight the benefit and the opportunity that if it is a, a four or six or an eight or a ten person business, they can lay the perfect foundation, excuse the building pun, and then they can build from that. Uh, whereas I think if you were coming into an established SME or a large organization, there's a lot of inertia against. And, you know, I was talking about the workshops that he does with Colleen and months and months to change culture. I, I really am a, a kind of a firm believer in the power of sharing stories as well. And so getting a similar profile business maybe four or five or six years ago that hooked on to um, inclusion and diversity and what the benefits were for them. So there's kind of relevancy in the, in the vocabulary that they're going to say. Not saying if you look up the HBR um, index, you're going to get a 30% increase in productivity. D none of that stuff, right? So if you actually went back and found a similar profile organization that's grown a wee bit more and then highlight the opportunity, very difficult task, but a super opportunity you have, yeah. And if you can take the pencils off them on site, because they're the offenders of drawing dicks everywhere. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to take this question because uh, I grew up um, demystifying these things for my parents who, who were in a small business and, you know, from a non-English speaking background. And um, so over the years, even though I work with a lot of large organisations, you know, my favourite part of my job is demystifying the law for small business. And I think it is about um, trying to uh, establish what are the key principles. And that's, you know, part of what I'm, you know, sort of giving back now with the book and with the um, training sessions that we offer. Um, the most important thing I would say as a membership-based organisation is that you do cherry-pick, you know, what they, need, what they need to do and what they must do to comply with the law. Um, one of the big traps that I've seen um, where you... where sort of policies or contracts have been reused, policies and procedures in particular, is that what is appropriate and um, necessary and reasonable for a small business is nothing like what is appropriate, reasonable and necessary for a larger business. And so you could have this amazing, like, you know, Lend-Lease or, you know, whatever it is, Hall or Wilcox um, policy that and procedure or complaints resolution procedure that is, you know, fantastic and best practice. But the reality is that Bob... Um, the carpenter is not going to do what it says in that policy or procedure and um, that actually is going to put him at a disadvantage and is probably going to um, cause a, a more risk from a legal point of view because there's been a reasonable expectation created that he will comply with that policy. So I think as a membership-based organisation, if you've got some resources that you can tap into to look at there is so much freely available online, it is insane. Um, but to cherry pick what they must do as a small employer and make sure that um, where you do establish the policies, if you can invest in something that is, you know, a high level review of a guideline framework, um, that is much better than a reproduction of anything that is too prescriptive because it creates a rod for their own back. Thanks, Colleen. Um, James Phyllis from SMEC. Uh, first of all, thank you to the panel. Uh, it's uh, um, an assemblage of incredible minds. So thank you for sharing all of your knowledge and so on. I think what we do as leaders in this space, we need to recognise is critically important because the leadership that we show flows down to our entire organisations. Um, congratulations to Consult Australia because one of the leaderships that they've done today is they've actually produced a gender balanced panel. Um, it's one of the really small things, but if we focus on all of these small things, they add up into big things. Um, and I'd encourage everyone to, 
to think about those things. A couple of shout outs to, to some other things that come through Champions of Change. The Engaging Men program is amazing. If you're interested, please engage with it. Um, the female sponsorship program is pretty amazing as well and it is making a substantial difference in all of your businesses and those people that are involved with it as well. Um, the, th the question that I had for the panel was if there was one or two things that you would really encourage people to take away from today, the things that they could do to start having an immediate impact, because we like to come to these things and figure out what can I do from this, what might that be? And I'll open that to anyone that's prepared to answer the question. Thank you. I'll have a crack. Um, look, I think because ultimately if we want to shift what's going on, we need to shift the mindsets and beliefs of ourselves and the people in our organisations. Um, you know, I think there's two things. One would be we need to reflect on our own mindsets and beliefs. Where do they come from? What do we hold? Make, as I said before, make the invisible visible and see if it still stacks up. And then to engage a little bit like Dave was saying in, in conversations which engage people's curiosity in what's going on and what can we do about it and where does all this come from. So I think, I think we, and this goes beyond you know, the specific topic we're talking about here, but societally we need those conversations and we need real conversations that engage people mm -hmm. rather than you know, force people into this camp or that camp. So that'd be, that'd be one thing that I'd say, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Um, Alison or Dave? Um, I'm gonna give the guys in the room two things to do. Um, the first one is on a Monday morning, traditionally guys come in and talk about sport and girls go, oh, fuck, spare me. <laughs> and they leave the room. The sporting conversation is not important. It's the conversation that follows that's important. You finish with sport and then you're like, oh, what deal are you working on? What project? Oh, you need to talk to that person. I know that person. I'll introduce you. That is the informal networking that men get that women have left the room for. So please keep women in the sporting conversation on a Monday morning. My best friend at uni taught me the rules of every sport and I did not realise at the time what gift he was giving me. So keep women in the sporting conversation. The second one is please go home at five o'clock and pick up the kids. Because if you don't pick up the kids, your wife has to. And when your wife has to, she's left work, she's either working part-time, she's not taken a promotion, she can't work as hard. To get women into employment, we need to get dads home. So that's my challenge to the men in the, in the room. Can I add an addendum to that one? I hate cricket, I hate AFL, I hate, and never want to learn anything about rugby league. Are there any men in the room who like really couldn't give a crap about some of that? There's got to be one. And don't be, look, <laughs> look, see, there's more, than, there's a handful. Can I add that on Monday morning that you walk into the room and ask your female colleague, what'd you get up to this weekend? Great. And have a conversation about that if she doesn't like sport. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um. Do we go next? Um, <coughs> there's a couple of things I think uh, find the, find an advocate in your organization that people least expect and they're there I guarantee you that the advocate for this message is there you might have to dig a wee bit you might have to generate a bit of curiosity but if you're in a leadership capacity or a management capacity or a HR capacity your voice will have impact but the advocate the potential naysayer that people think, oh, it's the curmudgeon or it's the cynic or it's the heretic in the village. If he, because I'm gonna be gender specific, if he comes out passionately to talk about the benefits, that's the good oil right there, right? So that, that's a bit of homework is to try to find the advocate. Um, you know the elf on the shelf? Like I, I'm the elf on the privilege tree. So I'm aware of the elf on the privilege tree with the next sentence. I'm aware of the trauma and the fear and the anxiety from the march in Melbourne, but I have a bit of hope that things are turning around. But I'm the, I'm the male, and I totally understand why the eyebrows go up and go, well, it's easy for him to say that. I think that there's a bit of hope. I took a bit of positivity from the march, but, but it took me a couple of days to try to get over it. Um, there's progress, but it's way too slow. You talk about the pornography in the walls, and you go to sites, goodness me, it's 2024. 
Uh, to court a bit of controversy for a second here, um, I've been lucky enough to call this country home for 13 years. I'm a citizen. <coughs> um, I, I think we have a bit of a blokey environment problem. And I think the more that we can kind of stand up and say that other countries aren't perfect, I totally get that. But we do have a bit of a blokey environment problem. And we need to start to normalize that discussion as well. Foster the discussion. Sometimes it's going to be bumpy. It can be jarring. Um, generate a bit of curiosity. And, and the icebreaker around the sport, half the men couldn't care less about the sport either, but it's the socially easiest icebreaker. So it's okay to call it out and say, couldn't care less about the sport. What did you do at the weekend that filled up your cup emotionally? What did you do? What, what was one thing that made you happy over the weekend? You know, a different coffee machine starter for the conversation. I'm aware of the privilege thing, and I apologize about it because some eyebrows went up, and that's totally fair. Thanks, David. Faye? Um, I was deliberate in doing that um, because if you do all of these things that everyone has been talking about today, compliance will sort itself out. We can even either sit here and go through every website um, and there's probably about six that I can cite to you and you can get a little tick box out and, and try and work out how to comply with the laws one at a time. But I guarantee you that if you have a flexible supportive environment, a respectful environment, one, you know, where people feel included, one where people belong. You you won't have bullying, you won't have sexual harassment, you won't have sexually hostile, you know, conduct. You won't end up in an application for orders to stop bullying or sexual harassment. You won't have regulators knocking at the door. Um, so that's the good, that's the really good news. And when you're framing conversations around these conduct issues, the second point I would say given the industry that you're in, um, you know what safety culture is. Um, you know what hard hats look at and you look like and you know how to um, make people feel safe at work from a physical point of view. I dare say if I did put, so put a physical hazard out in this room um, today, um, like a trip hazard across this floor, you would all look at that and go, oh, work health and safety issue. You need to look at bullying, sexual harassment, um, exclusion in the workplace, anything that looks like disrespect or hostile conduct, and you need to look at that and go, ooh, safety issue, orange jumpsuit. Thanks, Faye. So um, I just want to say thank you to everyone again, and I hope all of you have taken some inspiration and some good tips from today's panel. I do encourage you to have open, honest, and courageous conversations, particularly with the women in your firm, uh, for the men. And for the women, I'd invite you to have some courageous conversations with the men in your firm, too. When it's a large firm, you can do a survey, focus groups, to find out what's really happening. In a smaller firm, you, I think to the point about finding some allies who you can have these conversations with first and then invite your leadership in. I'm going to hand back to Jonathan to close us out for the day. Amazing uh, discussion, and a discussion particularly in those closing comments that I think provokes action. And if you're taking action already, it's around thinking around what your next step is going to be. I think that there is hope. I think when we heard about the progress that's taken us here to this regulatory environment that we find ourselves in, that is a story of progress uh, over the last two decades, and it's one that we need to think about as we think about those actions that you take in your organisations moving forward. It is difficult, but it is absolutely doable. An enormous round of applause for the panel, for Colleen, Alison, <laughs> David, Paul and Faye. We have in this panel incredible expertise and incredible generosity in giving of their time and their experience to share with you those tips and tricks that can lift uh, the whole industry, which is why Consult Australia is here. It's here to share that best practice and encourage us all to be better. We thank uh, the New South Wales Women in Construction Program for their support in establishing this program that is visionary from the government as it supports organisations like us to get you in this room here together. We thank Consult Australia's gold sponsors, Plan to Cover, Platinum Sponsor, Arcadis, and Consult Australia Industry Champions, SMEC, Stantec, ACOM, GHD, Oricon, and Jacobs. Thank you all for your support of Consult Australia. 
there should be more people that hear the messages that were delivered today. That's why we've recorded this event. So we will share that recording with you and encourage you to share it uh, through your networks and peers. The workshop that I spoke about as part of this broader program is a fantastic opportunity uh, for the rest of this financial year to get engaged in those practical actions, to sit and spend even more time uh, with Colleen and Paul and understand the steps that you can take to affect change in your organisation. So don't miss that opportunity and speak to Linda to take the next step as we move that forward. Thanks Amy and Linda and Karen for pulling this event together. Thanks all of you for participating and I look forward to continuing to engage with you through Consult Australia. Thanks so much. Have a great afternoon.